This year, Sundance's Next Fest is celebrating the 25th anniversary of Reservoir Dogs by giving their Vanguard Award to Tarantino. And we're celebrating along with them with an even bigger honor, a spot on one of our lists, specifically reverse engineered for prime inclusion. Take that, Sundance. These are the top 10 movie crimes of all time. So to organize our 10, we're going to break down the best crimes by part, honoring the best plan, the best team, the best getaway, the best cover up and the like. So first up, before you get the crime, you gotta have a motive. Maybe this is justice, a la Boondock Saints, or revenge, as in Blue Ruin. Maybe it's love or lust or family. Bronson commits crimes to get back to jail. Mr. Brooks to give his daughter an alibi. Thomas Crown because he's bored. Bodie for the rush. Leonard to keep the guilt at bay. And M's Peter Lorre because of the torment inside. However, for our first pick, we're going with Sonny's reason for stealing from Dog Day Afternoon. You're in that hospital there with all them tubes coming out and you want that fucking operation, right? You're giving me that shit. Everybody's giving me shit. Everybody needs money. You know what I mean? So, you needed money, I got your money. That's it. Shit. Yeah. Well, I didn't ask you to go and rob a bank. No, I know you didn't ask me. I know you didn't ask me. Look, I want to, you know, I'm not putting this on anybody. You know, nothing on nobody. I did this on my own. Sonny is out for money for his partner's sex change that he wouldn't even want. But instead of a punchline or a caricature, this improbable motive by an incompetent thief based on a true story in the hands of Pacino and Sarandon becomes utterly moving and sympathetic. It is an immensely honest look at crime in the strangest of circumstances, never faltering for a plot point or a shocking twist or a cheap laugh, but compassionate and honest to the core. Once you have a motive, you have to craft a plan. Done iconically in The Killing, charmingly in Brothers Bloom, opaquely in The Sting, sneakily in Die Hard, and on and on to great fun and effect in Dial M for Murder, Strangers on a Train, White Heat, and Murder on the Orient Express. However, for our second pick, we think Gone Girl's spoiler-filled crime of a century takes the cake. To fake a convincing murder, you have to have discipline. You befriend a local idiot. Harvest the details of her humdrum life and cram her with stories about your husband's violent temper. Secretly create some money troubles, credit cards, perhaps online gambling. You need to package yourself so that people will truly mourn your loss. Revealed like a landmine halfway through its execution, there is something intimidatingly brilliant about both the plan and its author. Obsessively and meticulously listed and journaled and calendared, the stationary budget of the logistics arm of the operation alone would dwarf the take of lesser schemes. Planning prowess is usually the land of the caper and the heist, but Gone Girl's frame-up job is just about as insane as its mastermind. And we get an all-access backstage pass to its neurotic brilliance in the cinematic equivalent of how to pin a murder on your husband for dummies. Now, unless you're lone wolfing it, which tons of great crime films do, after the plan, it's time to assemble the team. These are odd couples like those in Collateral, Natural Born Killers, and Leon. And they're super teams like those in Inception, The Asphalt Jungle, and Topkapi. The Rat Pack is just about as classic as they come in Ocean's Eleven. However, for our number eight pick, we're actually going with Ocean's Eleven. You'd need at least a dozen guys doing a combination of cons. What do you think? Well, off the top of my head, I'd say you're looking at it. A Boski, a Jim Brown, uh, a Miss Daisy, two Jethros, and Leon Spinks. Not to mention the biggest Ella Fitzgerald ever. While Clooney may be no Sinatra and Brad Pitt is certainly no Dean Martin, what they lack in Golden Age Vegas lounge singing cred, the rest of the team makes up for in depth. Because while our Ocean's Eleven sports a varied cast of almost a dozen uniquely ridiculous felons, Ocean's Eleven is basically just the Rat Pack and the Six who? So sure, we're not winning any award for out-of-the-box thinking for this pick, but as its name suggests, Ocean's Eleven's main conceit and source of joy is its legendary team, dedicating its best parts to the recruitment, management, and fraternal infighting of the team, and honestly, we just kind of love it. The team is in place and the plan is set, but now it's time to prepare. Done brilliantly in the original Italian job, Ronin, Taxi Driver, Thief, The Score, and Heist, great films have been populating their second acts with this simmering buildup almost as long as they've been committing crime. But for our favorite prep work, there's something wonderfully twisted about Ichi the Killer. <laughs> I'm 
で早く言わない腐っちまうぞ言うこと聞かないから罰が当たったんだよ So, yeah, Ichi the Killer is f***ing insane. And that goes for both the movie, the man, and the preparation. Takashi Miike, legendary Japanese filmmaker into whose brain we would very much not like to being John Malkovich ourselves, sets up an assassination plot that involves some kind of sadomasochistic Manchurian candidate memory implantation to turn the normally mild-mannered but perverted Ichi into a homicidal maniac. So, what can we say? In terms of pure balls-to-the-wall creativity, you gotta give it to Ichi. Because this shit is nuts. Before we barrel headfirst into the act of crime itself, let's not lose sight of one last key element. The objective, the score, the victim, the goal. This is the biggest diamond you could ever imagine in Snatch, or kidnapping one's own wife in Fargo, it's the world's best MacGuffin in the Maltese Falcon, and a vicious decapitation of parking meters in Cool Hand Luke. Absconding with a quintuplet in Raising Arizona because they'll hardly miss one is a hilarious haul, but for our number six pick, we're just a little more partial to Inside Man's take. Then I, the zite, the vinegar zoot, the robbers disappear, poof. And they don't take a nickel, right? You asking me? Yes, I'm asking you. I mean, it's your bank, you own it, I'm asking you. It's a you. tiny part of our organization. No robbers, no real victims, no loot missing. It's gotta be the first time in law enforcement history. I never heard of it before. So you gotta ask yourself, what the f*** happened? Don't you miss the case? In a film with such a brilliant plan to commit such a well-thought-out crime with such fantastic cop and robber cat and mousery, walking out of the bank one week later with a pocket full of precious stones would be enough for us to fully enjoy the ride of puzzling through the what and the how. But it is often forgotten that the why involves a most peculiar asterisk, secret evidence of Nazi collusion in the form of a stolen diamond ring left as a gift to Denzel for the Office of War Crimes Committee. Halfway through our list and it's finally time for the crime itself, the execution of it, how brilliantly the act is carried out. This leads us to the clockwork bank robbery of Heat, the silent criminal symphonies of Le Cirque Rouge and Rafifi, the underwater machinations of Sexy Beast, the Kansas City shuffle of Lucky Number Slevin, and our number five pick, the absolutely Machiavellian insanity of Old Boy. <laughs> Pretty much from the jump, we land here at the execution of a truly nefarious scheme. Well oiled and entirely unexplained, Daisu is systematically kidnapped, imprisoned, manipulated, and hypnotized with little fanfare or apparent reason, and then he's let go. And when it looks like it's all over, the depravity has just begun. His puppet master pulling the strings with such subtlety and distance that we hardly realize it until he does way, way too late. The crime is over, but we've still got four more slots on this list, because as any crime film writer knows, once the deed is done, you've got a whole third act to write, and the very next part is usually the getaway. Think No Country for Old Men, Breathless, every badass sequence from Drive, and the entirety of Oh Brother Where Art Thou? But for our number four pick, there's no movie that did getaways quite so well as Catch Me If You Can. Step out of the bathroom! Hands on your head. Oh, that's the new IBM Selectric. Put your hands on your head. Print type in five seconds. Shut up! Pop out the ball. Put your hands on your head. Put your hands. You know he's got over 200 checks here. A hands of on your head. head. Drafting. He even has little payroll envelopes Put it addressed down. to himself. From Put it down. Drop it. Relax. You're late. All right. My name is Alan, Barry Allen, United States Secret Service. Catch Me If You Can is basically a crime film stuck in a constant state of getaway, with Frank Abagnale Jr.'s various forms of the disappearing act giving us far more delight than his actual check fraud. He is a chameleon, someone new every time the feds get close, a pilot, a secret service agent, a doctor, a lawyer, literally a doctor lawyer, and always a master escape artist, constantly entertaining us by staying one step ahead of his would-be captors the entire way through. After the getaway comes the cover-up. These are the Kurt incident from Pusher 2, the ending of The Departed, and the majority of the usual suspects and double indemnity and the third man, Vertigo and Brick. And while we love all of them, especially the third man, they'll never get between us and our one and only Chinatown. In case you're interested, your husband was murdered. Somebody's been dumping thousands of tons of water from the city's reservoirs and we're supposed to be in the middle of a drought. He found out about it and he was killed. 
There's a waterlogged drunk in the morgue, involuntary manslaughter if anybody wants to take the trouble, which they don't. It seems like half the city is trying to cover it all up, which is fine by me. But Mrs. Mulray, I goddamn near lost my nose. And I like it. I like breathing through it. And I still think that you're hiding something. There's something especially elaborate about any cover-up in a film noir. They trade in shady dealings and double crossings and duplicitous dames and dangerous truths that lurk just beneath the surface. And Chinatown unravels the best of the bunch, tangled up from the personal to the political. The elaborate twists and turns that conceal the true extent of the crimes taking place give perfect credence to the old mantra that it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. That is, until it works. Closing in at number two, we've got one last optional step before our last stop, the capture. Look for this in films from the detective's perspective, and older crime picks that were required by censorship codes to punish their criminals in the end. This is intercut in Silence of the Lambs, ever quotable in Scarface, bullet ridden in Bonnie and Clyde, long sought in Taken, serendipitous in The Postman Always Rings Twice, and all a part of the plan in our number two pick, Seven. Your wife called before. Get yourself an answer machine. Detective. After this, I'm Detective. gone. No big surprise. Detective! You're looking for me. 95 minutes into an extended, meticulous, stymieing pursuit of an ever-elusive serial killer who is always a few steps ahead of his investigators, he just shows up. Since imitated but never replicated, this apprehension has to be about the most brilliantly subversive in all of crime cinema at the time. As unexpected as it is, as counter to genre traditions as it ran, it doesn't let the wind out of the sails. Instead, it inflates them. We've learned enough about the killer before even seeing his face to know not to trust his surrender. And as you'll know if you've seen in the film, it's for a very, very good reason. And finally, at number one, we're looking at a crime's aftermath. The waves that ripple out from the simple disturbance of a single criminal act. This is a prison sentence in A Prophet, a cartoonist's investigation in Zodiac, a long deliberation in Twelve Angry Men, a fiancé's revenge in I Saw the Devil, competing accounts in Rashomon, bizarre infamy in Chopper, two brothers reckoning in Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, and the very reason we're here with our number one pick, a warehouse full of deceit from Reservoir Dog. <laughs> It's been 25 years since Tarantino's not really freshman effort, but we all pretend it is because nobody saw my best friend's birthday, premiered at Sundance in 92. Largely a study in trust and mistrust in the aftermath of a robbery gone wrong, Reservoir Dogs used its contained thriller concepts to revolutionize independent filmmaking. The polish, intelligence, and execution of this film, born outside of the studio system, was unheard of for the time, and its restraint in keeping us almost exclusively in the world post-crime, endlessly talking about it but never showing it, makes the fallout all the more exciting than the act itself, which is why it's our pick for one of the best movie crimes of all time. So, what do you think? Disagree with any of our picks? Do we leave out any of your favorite film crimes? Of course we did. We take secret pleasure in disappointing all of our biggest fans. So let us hear about it in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix Movie Lists.